All right, good morning, everyone. Today we're going to learn about our keyboard instruments. And if you're thinking to yourself for a second, wait, didn't you make a big deal about the piano being a percussion instrument? I'll say, yes, I did. And that was the piano. However, the piano is also a part of another family, and that is the keyboard instruments. You're going to watch this video here in order to learn about the different kinds of keyboard instruments, as keyboard instruments all share one important similarity, but then may change in the way they make sound. The keyboard family is defined by the manuals that these instruments use. Keyboard instruments are a set of instruments that use a set of manuals to control the mechanism that produces sound. A manual is a set of keys. Instruments may have multiple sets of manuals that control the device that produces sound. So in this picture to our right, we're going to see a couple different members of the keyboard family, starting with the piano, which is a chordophone and a percussion instrument inside the keyboard family. Now, if that sounds crazy to you, we're going to dive into more of what that means. And if you did not hear the word chordophone before, please let me refer you to the video linked in the first slide where it says, watch this video. Why is the piano a chordophone? Well, the piano is a chordophone because strings live inside the keyboard and they are what are manipulated to make sound. The strings are manipulated by a hammer that hits the string, therefore making the act of sound being produced a percussive act, right? So that's why you get these multiple crossovers. Yes, it's in the keyboard family. Yes, it is a percussion instrument. And yes, it does use strings to make sound pretty complicated and you wouldn't think about it. There are other instruments in this family as well. We're going to learn about the harpsichord, the clavichord, which are also chordophones. They use different methods of producing sound. Inside of each of these instruments are strings. However, instead of hammers, there are plectrums. Back in the 1400s and 1600s, these plectrums are made out of feathers or quills. And when a key was depressed, a quill would pluck a string. So you get a different sound. We have an organ and we have an accordion. These are both keyboard instruments. However, they're aerophones. Aerophones use air to produce sound. Air is sent through the organ's pipes when a key is depressed. As when you squeeze an organ, uh, sorry, when you squeeze an accordion closed, air will be sent through the instrument and depending on which keys are pressed depends on which harmony you will hear. The organ is a special instrument because it has three manuals for the hands, meaning three keyboards for the hands. And then it also has a pedal manual. And what a pedal manual is, it's essentially a keyboard that the person would control with their feet. So if you think about that for a second, the organ player would have the bass line to play with their feet and then two other parts, one for the right and one for the left hand. So an organ player is a pretty monster musician, if you ask me. Moving back in time, let's learn a little bit more about the clavichord. The clavichord is a rectangular European keyboard that was invented in the early 1400s. And this was typically used in the Renaissance and Baroque eras. Clavichords were used mainly for composition reasons, as they did not offer a loud enough volume to play live concerts. So you wouldn't really find this at a show, right? And this is also why in the Renaissance eras, you didn't see pianos at concerts, because they simply didn't exist in that regard at this time in the 1400s. The music that was composed on that was then brought out to a string quartet and performed live because the more instruments you had playing live, the fuller the sound became. The instrument gets its name in Western culture from the Latin word clavis, which means keys. Eastern cultures also have their versions of this instrument that are still used today, and some of them are even plucked with your fingers. When we learn about strings, you learn about zithers, and zithers are the closest to clavichords that I can think of. Moving forward in time, we're looking at the harpsichord. And the harpsichord is another one of these devices that has a plucking mechanism attached to the manual. Harpsichords typically have two manuals. Each manual has a different level of dynamic 
which means level of intensity that it can play because a player cannot play with dynamics when they use the harpsichord. So what that means is that if a player plays soft or a player plays really loud, it'll still sound the same on a harpsichord. That's why there's two manuals. Each manual often offers a different dynamic. So that means that each manual offers a different level of intensity of sound and a specific sound quality when that is chosen. And the player can choose which one they want to use thinking about what they wanted to communicate in the piece. So when we talk about dynamics, sorry, when we talk about dynamics, we're talking about terms used to describe the intensity of the music. Dynamics are different than volume or loudness. We want to think about these as intensity, right? So we can see on the scale right here, we have terms that you probably are familiar with here. If we look at piano and we look at forte, these are some of the more common dynamics, right? Piano being soft, forte being intense, mezzo forte is right there, kind of intense, mezzo piano is kind of soft, pianissimo, very, very, very light, fortissimo, very intense, forte piano is interesting, that's very loud and then soft, and then sforzando is like very loud and then a stop. And then we're looking at over here, the modern piano. Now this isn't the modern piano that we're used to, but this is one of the first versions of the piano forte. Now the modern piano was invented by Bartolomeo Cristofori in about 1700. He was a talented harpsichordist and he built the first version of the piano, called it the piano forte. It was all on a wooden frame and originally called the pianoforte because this instrument could play both intense and soft dynamics. In 1820, the piano started using a metal frame to secure the strings and the shape of the instrument. Pianos that were only made out of wood would eventually buckle, and it was also hard to keep them in tune, right? So you can imagine the amount of tension inside this instrument due to all the strings. There was one pianist by the name of Franz Liszt it was rumored to have broken a number of pianos in the early 1800s when they were still on wooden frames because this guy was like six and a half feet tall and his hands were giant and he would play these intense pieces that were like really, really, like really loud and really like little intense. So you would see it and sometimes keys would break because he was hitting the keyboard hard and these would be concert pianos. So. It's just kind of crazy to think about how a person could do that to an instrument that's so big and then how technology had to change to accommodate that. So we're looking over here. Here's a list. Here's a couple of links of different virtuosos, right, or pioneers. When you think about a virtuoso, you think of someone who plays incredibly well or is super talented that can play things that not everyone can play. And I want you to take a look at one of these four virtuosos and pick one and write about the song that you listen to or the piece of music that you listen to, okay? Please listen to the whole thing and use your best listening vocabulary to describe what you hear in those questions. The last family that we're going to look at are the keyboard instruments of today that are a little bit more electronic. They're synthesizers. A synthesizer is an electronical instrument that uses a electric signal to generate audio signals that make sound. Um, these are the newest addition to the keyboard family of instruments. And you'll hear these in a lot of the music styles you listen to today. Back when they started, instead of using keys and knobs to get their sounds, you'd have to connect different patches to get sound. So it's a little bit more it was a little bit more, it took, um, took a little bit more skill or finesse to really get a sound. Nowadays, you can download something and get a whole bunch of sounds, whereas in the 50s when this started, people would have to know which cable to connect to which slot to get that right sound. Um, so these instruments has really come a long way. The first person to make 
A synthesizer was a guy named Harry Olson and his partner Herbert Bellar. In 1955, they worked for RCA. There are also these really cool, cool synthesizers that are still used today called Moog. Now, Roland is a good company of synthesizers for those of you who are interested in learning more about electronic music and synthesization. All right, so we're looking at this keyboard instrument form. You're going to answer all the basic questions. And then we have this question is found in that first video. And then the rest of the questions you should be able to answer from my video and from the slides in the slideshow. All right, everyone, good luck with this. This should be significantly easier than the orchestral assignment. Good luck and be well.